That, great, thanks. Because I want to go over some of the lines. I think they're very helpful. You know, the normal shoulder, what, it is so, so, this makes emergency medicine to me so much more fun, so much more interesting if you know what you're looking at. You know, and know all these different bones. You know, the chromium, the coracoid. Um, you know, you have your glenoid, which is a continuation of the scapula. Know all these things. Um, the normal Y view, this is so critical to know this stuff. You know, that you have um, your coracoid and your chromium over here, and then you have your, the uh, spine. Um, the body of the scapula right here. Now, why is this important? Because the coracoid is anterior and this is posterior. So when you're looking at a Y view, you know when you look where that humeral head is sitting, you know which way it's going. And you're not going to know that. It's kind of like when you're intubating a patient, you, you know that the glottis is right underneath the epiglottis. Once you find the epiglottis, you know, as Rich Levitan says, you know, he just, the whole intubation is called epiglottoscopy because once you find the epiglottis, you're okay. Here, knowing this is going to point you, tell you what kind of dislocation you have. And then, you know, your axial view. Axial view is really critical um, because in some uh, dislocations, you may not see it on a Y view. And this is just pointing out what the different bones are on, on this axillary view. Here's the glenoid. Sometimes it's hard. You really got to look to find this. And here's the clavicle, you know, coming in. And then your coracoid um, is up here, this bone over here. And I, you know, look at, looking at the axle view, trying to tell anterior poster, just remember the coracoid is anterior. So just quickly, anterior, um, you know, the AP view, you know, that looks like it's outside the glenoid, the humeral head. The Y view, on the left, you see it's right sitting in the middle of the Y. On the right, boy, I'm not hard to I'm saying that, but it's really going towards the coracoid, which is a typical anterior uh, dislocation. Now, you're looking at this on an um, axial view, and here's normal, it's sitting inside the glenoid fossa. There, it's, here's your glenoid right here, and the uh, humeral head's right outside. So, how does an anterior uh, dislocation present? Um, there, and the vast majority are. There, it's an abduction, external rotation injury. They come in with their arm a little abducted, looks externally rotated. They are unable to touch your other shoulder, so they can't internally rotate. You know, you can just look at them, their shoulders squared off, um, you know, and age determines, you know, how much immobilization they're going to get. You know, younger patients are more likely to re-dislocate, and they're also, um, you know, like, more likely to have more trauma to do it. So they generally need to be mobilized longer. The older patient, we're concerned about developing stiffness, and the older person is also less likely to develop, you have a re-dislocation. So they're not going to be immobilized as long. Just remember, older patients, almost all of them, when they dislocate their shoulder, they're going to have a rotator cuff injury. So they all need to follow up with ortho. Okay, so it's, it's just so common. They may have it before they injured or they may do it with that shoulder dislocation. But just keep that in your mind that you really need to think about that. This patient comes in, he's unable to abduct, externally rotate. Um, okay, so he can't move his arm out. He actually, the, the next one, so the, he, that's just showing he has limited external rotation. Um, he's blocks external rotation. So not, this is not typical of an um, anterior dislocation. Okay, you get a, an x-ray. This is his AP view. Looks like there's a fragment of bone over there, but the, the humeral head looks like it's in place. So you get an AP view, I mean a Y view. And certainly, it, here's your chromium, the coracoid's over there. It looks like it's going towards your chromium, but it's not clearly, it doesn't look like anterior. If anything, it's posterior, but it's not clear. And now, you get your axillary view. You can see it's clearly out. And it's, here's your coracoid over here. It's posterior. Okay, so just know you're not, the, the bones really help a lot. This axillary view may be the only thing showing you have a posterior dislocation. So you got to really try and get that. Sometimes it's hard because the patient won't tolerate it. And there's certain other way, you know, tricks you can do. Um, posterior dislocation, half of these are missed because you know, you're not, people are not thinking about it, they're not getting an axillary review, so you can miss this injury. And 15% of them are bilateral. They're the three E's. Electricity, epilepsy, what's the other one? Electricity, epilepsy, um, forgot what the other one is, but it's an E. And um, whatever it is, you know, you gotta think about it. And especially if it's bilateral, then everything's gonna be symmetrical, so you're not, but if they can't move on their shoulders, you know you gotta really, there's something going on. Um, 
They hold their arm in internal rotation. They can externally rotate it. Um, there's the light bulb sign. You know, we're, it's internally rotated so you don't see the greater tub tuberosity. Um, and here, let's just look. Okay, so here's normal. It's got this kind of greater tuberosity that's rounder. Why do you see that? Here's the tibial tuberosity, or the greater tuberosity when it's when you're it's internally rotated because it's posteriorly dislocated. Then it just takes the greater tuberosity is no is not seen. That's actually normal. But here, you know, you have normal, and now it's turned inward, so you get this um, light bulb sign. And then you can also get the rim sign where there's overlap. The shoulder, you know, the humeral head's behind it, so there's going to be overlap. A bunch of subtle findings. Um, this is AP view. There's some overlap. Um, there's a Y view. This is normal. This looks like here's a coracoid that's going towards the chromium. Once again, looks posterior. And um, there, this is the once again Y view. You can see that it's not where it's supposed to be, and it's not where your typical anterior dislocation is. Um, okay. And getting an axillary view sometimes can clear things up. This one, patient got an x-ray. On the second one to the right, it looks like it's a posterior dislocation. Um, they repeated the Y view because it wasn't an optimal Y view. Now it looks like it's more in the center. Then they get a, an axial view, the bottom right, and it's clearly within the glenoid fossa. So it clears up any question that the thing is dislocated. Don't forget to look at the scapula. You know, there can be a scapular fracture. That's certainly something we're going to forget about. Tendinitis, you know, you see this. I just put this in because I, I don't actually, I would probably misdiagnose this. But these tendinitis, they actually do well with shock treatment. You know, they break up the particle. It actually does well and they do well with injections. And you can get these calcific tendinitis, you know, on the hip as well as, well as on the elbow. Okay. Um, 17-year-old, left shoulder pain after falling on a ball. What, what strikes you about this x-ray? What are you concerned about? Or just clavicle. Right. But yeah, well, or maybe, is this clavicle abnormal or is this one abnormal? Well, I got to say, if he's complaining of pain on his left side, I go for the other side. Right. And so, so the clavicle has, has kind of disappeared there. So what, you know, what could that be? Just like, you know, when you lose your socks or something. So um, you get an x-ray. And you see anything on the x-ray? And oftentimes these x-rays are negative. But he, I'll tell you, he's, he can't move his shoulder, but he's very tender over his sternum and medial to his sternum. So what are you thinking? No. What's dislocated? <laughs> Where? Clav okay, you're close. So sterno clavicular dislocation, okay? It's, this is one of the few life-threatening ortho emergencies, okay? You know, there's hip dislocation, all this. This, if it's posterior dislocated, there are a lot of important structures back there which could be impinging on. So, you know, in fact, when you look at this, most of these are negative, but his left clavicle, when you look at it, this, the right one's a little bit higher, the left one's a little bit lower. You know, and that could be a subtle sign that something's going on. So uh, most of these are anterior. The posterior ones are the one you got to worry about. Um, you know, they may see nothing, but if, if one side is higher, you know, the clavicle is higher than the other. But CT is really the best way to go. Um, this is just showing the clavicle is higher on one side. Here's showing the clavicle low down on the patient. Huh? Would you be able to, like, sense that on palpation? No. I don't, I, I don't think he'd let you. You know, like, they probably punch you in the face. Um, and he, here, you know, it's just showing you. This is the x-ray, showing the clavicles down here. You know, there are all these structures. This may be something you also want to give, you know, IV contrast with because, um, you know, the trachea, all these structures, you know, you have your trachea, you have your, um, you have your major blood vessels over there. Um, you, you really, uh, this is something you need to really get a CAT scan on, sure, make nothing is injured. Okay. Now, just a variation on this, this guy has left shoulder pain. So what do you think here? So once again, if I didn't tell you which side, maybe you'd say his problem's on the right, because you can't see his clavicle very well on his right. But here, the clavicle is much more prominent. And he's tender, once again, medially. So this is likely an anterior 
uh, dislocation. It's actually now coming out. This is the more common version. This is not an emergency. Nothing's at risk. You know, um, but think about it when you see a much more prominent clavicle on one side, the side of injury. Okay, very quickly, I just want to go over a few lines. Any questions so far? Probably don't have any time for questions anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there, I, there are a few things which I think are really important here. To, you know, you want to look at. Okay, uh, okay, you look at this. You know, he's got pain. He fell on his hand. I'll tell you something. What is wrong with this X-ray? You'll probably never figure it out. But there are a lot of different names for this. This sign. Does anyone remember? No one will remember this. Terry Thomas, old film actor, um, had a big space between his teeth. You know, now it's David Letterman or Mike Tyson or what's his name? Madonna. I didn't even know she had a big space between her teeth. Um, <laughs> But uh, so it's that sign. This is, you know, a scaphoid lunate dislocation. Okay? So, how do you make that diagnosis? It's important just when you're looking at an AP version of the hand, there are three C's when you look at the proximal layer of your carpal bones and the distal layer. You should be able to draw a line like that. They should not be touching each other. You should be able to walk in between them. And they'll describe each one of these bones as like, I don't, you know, flagstone patio, you know, what you, they're put in neatly, they don't overlap, okay? Once they start overlapping, that's a key, there's something wrong. Okay, and also, the lateral view. What is the importance of the lateral view? I can only, it's generally to look for a triquetrum fracture or to look for a lunate dislocation. The radius, there are three cups here. The radius forms a cup with the lunate, with the capitate, and then with the third um, metacarpal, okay? Three cups stacking on each other. That's the way it should look. So here, it, you know, the scaphoid lunate, it, there's also, like, you may see the signet ring sign where the, the scaphoid's tilted and it, may, it has a little circle on it, makes it look like a signoid ring. This scaphoid lunate dislocation is on a continuum. There's a scaphoid lunate, then there's perilunate, and then there's lunate. They're all you know, on a, on a continuum, because this is the first part working towards the perilunate. So now you've got that, you know, subtle, um, you know, you've, you've got this more, th when you're looking at it, there should be l less than three millimeters separation between the carpal bones and that proximal layer. This is much more separated. This indication, you know, that there's a ligamentous injury there. Now, another 30-year-old with wrist pain after Fouche. Okay, once again, this is hard to see. But these, the proximal layer, the scaphoid lunate, um, they're all impinging on you know, the, uh, the capitate above. So what, you can't draw that C over here. Once again, indicating there's some pathology going on. Now you look over here. Uh, here's your lunate, right, the cup. It's really making contact with the radius. It's everything above it, which is not stacking up. Right, so, so what is this injury? It's, it's a what? Is it a lunate dislocation? It's not lunate because lunate's not dislocated. Lunate's still in contact with the radius. So if it's not a lunate, what is it? Peri, perilunate, okay? What is a perilunate? Perilunate's really, is a capitate dislocation. But they call it a perilunate because everything around the lunate is not dislocated. You know, Really, key, these things are missed. Okay, so it's important to have this in your repertoire. Know those C's. Okay, and um, you know, once again, when you look at this, you know, this one it doesn't stack up. Um, and once again, you can see the proximal row of carpal bones, scaphoid, lunate, um, triquetrum. Some lovers, yeah, they doesn't line up with the capitate. They're all overlapping. That. Is your first sign, you know, you, you can confirm that in your lateral. But no, you should be able to walk through in between all these bones, and when they're, you know, overlapping each other, that is abnormal. Okay, then this, what's, which, what fracture is this? You know, look at the right. Where is it? Where is the lunate? It's like, what do we call this? The spilled teacup, exactly. So this cup, right here. That means the lunate, that is a lunate dislocation, you know. And they talk about, you know, I would, this is, oh, this is just showing it even better, you know, your normal carpal bones. You know, here, there's this, the lunate, is, they call it triangular, but it's now overlapping the capitate. That's, you know, a clear sign that you have a perilunate or a lunate dislocation. 
And I, you know, if I had a splint this person, you know, I like a sugar tongue for wrist splints or carpal bones. Um, okay. I just, how much time we got? That it? Okay. Just remember, I just want to say, in terms of summary, in terms of the elbow, know your, know the lines for your elbow. There's an interline, you know, but make sure when you get a lateral, you know, to get a true lateral, you have to get your hourglass sign or called a figure of eight. If you don't see that, um, you know, it means that, uh, and it doesn't show that well here, but you know, you just a, a sign that you really can draw conclusions. You have to have a true lateral and know your anterior lunate, uh, anterior humeral line and your radial capitella line. Very important in terms of telling whether a young person has a supracondylar fracture. Okay, that's it.